In the last few months of 2017, we experienced unprecedented global climate disasters from storms with concentration throughout the United States, the Caribbean, Mexico, and parts of Asia. Within the same time period, earthquakes, wildfires, volcanoes, flooding, and mudslides brought destruction and death globally. As we began to receive reports of the destruction, response to the needs was already in progress. Local church pastors began putting together teams that made their way to the worst hit areas with skill sets in construction, electrical engineering, medical response, providing water and emergency supplies, hospitality and providing safe recovery areas, meals, etc. Churches across the disaster areas were set up as provision stations to accommodate those who had lost so much in the storm. What often emerged from the devastation was a response of compassion and caring for those affected by the storms. Ministry rose in many of these regions, providing a fresh revelation and new relevance of the gospel of Christ. Challenges provided opportunities and refocused ministries on how to do ministry in a shifting and crisis-centered community. As truckloads and boatloads of supplies were transported into the affected areas, the compassion of Christ revealed was not based on the name of the local church, rather on the Lord of the ministry responding to the needs of others. Even before we had a grasp on the degree of damage suffered, local church congregations were reaching out to their family in the U.S. and across the world. We remember one of the great blessings of our fellowship is the relationship we share with one another. In the midst of response, the Lord led us to service and connection in the global task of sharing the whole gospel to the whole world. Two international leadership meetings late in the year reflected a refocus of providing ministry in a crisis-shifting environment. Recognizing the collision of the fresh revelation of the gospel of Christ and the constant shifting world climate politically, financially, and astronomically. When we read about the outpouring of Pentecost in the book of Acts, we sense an urgency in the supernatural empowerment to evangelize the world. Part of that urgency was the sensitivity and gifting of power to be at the right place at the crisis moment like a rooftop experience when Gentiles seek you to share what the Holy Spirit has given in Acts chapter 10. At every crisis moment, God has positioned someone who is listening for his call. Positioned, the Holy Spirit opens our senses to have the mind of Christ and move in complete obedience to his directive. Only the Holy Spirit can take the word spoken in human weakness and carry it home with power into the mind and the heart, the conscience and the will of the hearers. The prophet reminds us, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. As the world continues to experience global climate shifting, may we be so positioned and empowered by the Holy Spirit that the Lord may lead us to service and connection in the global task of sharing the whole gospel to the whole world. March Mission Drive is one of the preparations and one of the provisions in response to the global mission call. You may find resources and information for your local church participation at the Global Missions Ministries website, www.globalcogop.org. I pray that you will be positioned by the Holy Spirit and empowered to respond to the need of support and supply in the nations during this effort. Thank you for your giving and may the Lord bless you. Amen. We have a monumental task set before us in the body of Christ. Amen. And that is the task of taking the gospel to all the world. And so today I want to preach on that, the main thing. And as we go through this today, I want you to challenge yourself to allow the Holy Spirit to speak directly to your heart. You know, God is very proud of you and proud of the fact that you sit in a church somewhere and that you go to church and that you're faithful in your stewardship principles and that you 
try to assist that local body, but we need to be about the Father's business of telling others about Christ. Uh, this local church is a part of a global church, as we just showed you, and has a mission and a commission to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. Whether we like it or not, that is what Jesus told us to do, to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. And to date, this local church participates with our global church around the world in 130 nations and over 130 nations. When Christ came, his mission was to do three things. And I want to talk about those three things today and how they affect your life. Did you know that God intends for every one of us in this room to be in, involved in the ministry of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ? How many of you know that about yourself, that it is your mandate? Let me ask that again because only two people raised their hand. How many of you in this room know that it is your responsibility to share the gospel with someone else? Raise your hand up high. That is a position that God has given us. When he came, he came and he brought three things and he put three things into play. One, he brought total salvation from all sin. Two, he started his church with 12 reckless men. And he empowered them with the Holy Spirit to carry the gospel around the world. And number three, he taught them on how to do soul winning. He led them around for about three and a half years and he taught them how to be soul winners. He taught them how to lay hands on the sick and to cast out demons and to raise the dead and to do all of those types of things. He taught them how to do that. And when he left, he left the entire position of the entire world in the arms of 12 men. Think about that. He left it to 12 guys. And on the day of Pentecost, there was 120, including women, in the upper room. And as they began to pray and to call upon the name of the Lord, that promise that Jesus had told them, called the Holy Spirit, came out of heaven and sat on each one of them. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. Now, let me tell you what the devil is doing. He is telling and, and pro propagating in the body of Christ that the Holy Spirit is no longer for this generation. That tongue talking ended with the close of the New Testament. But I'm here to tell you that the Holy Spirit is very much alive. And we need to be filled and empowered with the Holy Spirit. One of the reasons we're not taking the gospel to the world is because we don't have the gospel teller on the inside of us, which is the Holy Spirit. But when the Spirit gets inside of you it'll be impossible for you to t be silent and we need to allow that to get a hold of us going was a part of going was a part of reaching then and it still is today we cannot reach our world unless we start by going next door or down the street to our friends and to our fellow employees, we need to be about the Father's business. And this is not a message that we get excited about because it means that some of us are going to be taken out of our comfort zone and our comfort zone is a place that we love to be in. There are 28 Bible verses in the New Testament concerning evangelism. Now, when God says something 28 times, what do you think he's trying to get through to our thick heads? That this is a mandate from heaven. He said the main thing is, when he left the disciples, the main thing was what? Go into all the world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's look at that commission in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Jesus made this statement to the disciples. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, we want God to be with us in everything, don't we? Well, let me tell you, God is not going to be with us unless we do what this verse of Scripture teaches. God is not going to go into all the world with us. He didn't come to make me happy. He came to make me holy and to deliver me from my sin and to set me free and to put me on the path to heaven. And then He gave me a commission to tell the gospel with somebody that would listen and those that even won't listen. We have a mandate to tell them the story of Jesus Christ. And regardless of how we shake it or believe it or want to be a part of it or don't want to be a part of it, our mandate is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And I know today this is not popular to do that because we, uh, as, some, as someone told me, we hire professionals in our church to do that. Well, I can't see anywhere in Scripture that he hired professionals. He got fishermen and, and dads and, and moms and he got uh, women and men who were in business and he called them and he ordained them and he sent them forth. Christians are to go and to make disciples, to baptize and to teach them to obey all the things. Well, that might be the problem right there. Is we don't want to teach the all things. You know, sometimes today I am amazed by the number of folks that want to teach some of the things. And leave some of the things off. You know, the, Jesus had that problem with some of his disciples. You know, he had, he had more than 12 following him. I mean, he had, at least he had 82, I know, because uh, 70 of them left and 12 stayed. And one, you know, well, we know what one did. We'll talk about him later on in the month, in the beginning of next month. But when Jesus came up with some hard sayings, what did 70 of them say? Who can hear this? The Bible said they went away. Who can hear that when he's talking about the communion, eating of his flesh and drinking of his blood? He said, who can receive this? That's a hard saying. We don't want to be there. Let me tell you, being a missionary or being a soul winner is not the easiest task in the world. But it is a task that ensures you that Jesus Christ is going to be with you to the end of the very age. This verse gives the goal of the church in every generation. And it gives the promise. The goal, preach the gospel, make disciples the promise. I'll go with you. I don't know about you, but I want the Lord to go with me. Now I want to ask a question that you have to answer personally. How will we stand in judgment if we have not been involved in some way in the great commission of the church? How will we stand in judgment? You know we're going to be judged according to our works down here, right? I mean, it's not all about floppy duffy, you know. Just name it and claim it and blab it and grab it and run down the aisle and have a good time. It's not all about that. It's part of it. It's a part of serving God is to be blessed. But let me tell you, another part of it is to be involved in the work of the Lord. What will you say to the Lord if you go to church all of your life and stand at judgment day and have never shared the gospel with a single soul? What? Will you tell him? Those are questions we have to ask ourselves when it comes to the mission and the commission of the church. We have to ask ourselves, what account will we say? What will we say to the Lord? Because the Lord is going to ask for an account. You know the stories you read in the Bible about he gave this one this talent and that one that talent. And then the Lord of that house came and he wanted an accounting. You done good, you done good, and you did not do good. I'm going to take away everything from you. Some of you might get a cabin. No, I'm just kidding. But you see, when he gives us a mission to do, we can't not do that mission because we're going to stand before God on judgment and we will give an account. And I know this is not popular, but we're going to give an account. Yes, I'm going to be saved. Yes, I'm going to be in heaven, but I'm going to give an account. The crown that I wear, all of those things, what about that stuff? I dare say the Lord will probably have a few questions for us. And I don't want that to be one of the questions he asks me. Every Sunday, one of the things we pray for is souls. And each week, God is answering those prayers. And uh, we see people coming into the house of God. But I wonder if we do enough follow-up. When people come into God's house to make people feel connected or to help them get connected to the body. Now I want to talk a little bit about us. When people come into the house of God, regardless of who they are, they need to be made to feel welcome. Because you know what is happening? Some of your family members that you haven't met has came into your house. And you need to go over and say, well, brother or sister, so and so, I've never met you. But you're my brother in Jesus Christ. You're my sister in Jesus Christ. I'm so glad that you're here today. Day. We should invite new people out to lunch so we can get to know them. We should even invite them over to our homes for dinner. Do you know what that does for a new person when they go to church? If they've been in your home for dinner, when they come back to church and they don't know anybody, they got a connection with you. They feel comfortable because they've connected with you. We need to tell people the story of Jesus Christ. We need to do what we can. 
I believe God sends a clear message to the church in 2004. And in 2004, there was a movie that came out. Anybody know what that was? It was called The Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson. He wrote it and directed it and done all of those things. God shook Mel Gibson up, and he, he made this movie. You know, for all the things he hadn't done right, he did this one right. And it moved on his heart to make a movie that rocked our country. How many of you saw that movie? If you hadn't saw it, you ought to see it. It rocked the church world. I mean, I went to a theater, and people were sitting out there, and I was one of them. And my wife told me, please be quiet. I was sobbing so loud because of what I saw that my Lord went through. I think that ought to be a requirement that when you get saved, you go see that movie because it will rock your world. It was a movie that was politically incorrect because it was about the risen Savior. It was about the price of Calvary. It was about the penalty that he paid for my sin. But my friend, it shook the community of the church for a little while. People were healed and delivered just going and watching it. And for a little while, the sleeping giant called the church came alive with commitment and desire to see the whole world change. But it didn't last very long. God would have never given us the great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel if he never intended for that to be a reality. And when he saved you, he saved you for a purpose. And we're going to get to that in a little while in this sermon. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that should all should come to repentance. Now, you take that scripture and couple it with some other scriptures that talks about how shall they hear and how shall they know unless somebody preaches to them God doesn't want anybody on the planet earth to perish we know that some people are going to perish because they will not accept Jesus Christ but what that scripture is telling us is it's putting us on notice it is telling us that it is our responsibility to begin to share that gospel with everyone but none of us can do it alone can we no pastor can single-handedly Fulfill the calling regardless of how gifted he or she may be. Unless every one of us catches the fire in the long run, there will be no warmth against the chill of sin that's in the world. I mean, every member, every friend of the local church needs to catch the fire that I need to tell someone about the story of the living God. My prayer is that we will always be learners of the Word of God. That we would do all that we possibly can to learn about him and to know about him. John 17, 21 reads this way. That they may be one. Look what God is calling for. Look what Jesus is praying about there. He's praying for unity. Now I know when you look around in the, in the, in the church today, and when, I'm t when I say church, I mean the global church. When you look around the global church, my Lord, if 40, 50 preachers could get together in the same room, we would have to have a theological debate because this one's over here and that one's over there, and pretty soon we'd be, we'd be off in groups. We'd have the Pentecostal tongue talkers back there and the ones over here that don't believe it and the ones over there that don't believe that and the ones over here that don't believe in healing and the ones over there that believes anything goes. And that's how it would be segregated before too long because we would start to click together like a bunch of chickens. That's not God's plan, folks. God's plan is that we would be one, that we would stop this foolishness. Look, you know how we're going to get to be one? We're just going to have to get this book back out. We're going to have to brush the dust off us, and we're going to have to start reading this book. Every preacher ought to start reading this book. Yes, seminary is great. I went to seminary. They taught me a lot of things. Some I liked and some I couldn't stand. Some, I, some of the reports I made, I held my nose and made the report. It wasn't because I enjoyed not one second of it. And I complained to the professor, and he said, you know, you do need to read some things that are con a country controversial so you'll know what's right and what's wrong well I, I i did a report based on that principle but i surely didn't like it i did the research but i didn't like the research we need to take the bible and open the bible up and begin to just simply look at it so that all of us around the globe can begin to do what jesus said wouldn't it be wonderful you know we want him to answer every prayer that we pray every time i kneel i want him to heal me when i'm sick i want him to deliver me when i'm bound i want him to bless me when i'm financially in problem i want him to touch my children i want him to do all of that but wouldn't it be wonderful if we would just answer his prayer 
And that was his prayer, that they may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent us. You know, one of the reasons the world can't, has a hard time with the Christian community at large because on any given Sunday, they can go to this church and hear that. Then they can go over to this church and hear this. Then they can go to that church back there and hear that. And go to that church back there and hear that. In this church, well, we believe in, in the full restoration of the gifts to the church. Well, in this church, we, don't, we believe that healing and all that stuff stopped with the close of the New Testament. Where do you get any of those things? But that is the teaching that's out there. And, and I don't have a time to name the myriad of teachings that are out there. I mean, but... Uh, when I when I preach on heaven and all of that, I'll bring you to the seven major ones that we're talking about that that's going on on planet Earth today. But that is that is the ridiculousness of that. We need to be one in Jesus Christ. This was one of Jesus final prayers, his final prayers. This was one of the final prayers that the church that he died for and that was crucified for would simply begin to be one. We need to answer God's prayer. Do you know God has a plan for you? Let's look at John 15, 16. You did not choose me. Now, I know every one of you think you made that decision to accept Jesus Christ, but if you accepted Jesus Christ, it wasn't, on your, it wasn't by your idea. I know it wasn't my idea to accept him. I got arrested. That's just the bottom line, the end of the story. I went to the church, and, they, and God arrested me right there on the Put me in handcuffs, threw me on my face, and put his foot on me. Absolutely, that's what he did. That's what he felt like he did anyway. I didn't choose him. Had no intention when I walked in that church, when I walked in the Pentecostal Church of God, had absolutely no intention of accepting Jesus Christ. Not one. I went to get Mama quiet. But I didn't go to find Jesus. But as I went in there, I was arrested and put in jail. The Lord arrested my heart and saved me. He said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Let me tell you, I certainly didn't go to get saved. I certainly didn't anticipate being a preacher. I was going to be a cattle rancher. I already had my future planned out. I was going to ag school. I was going to get my degree in agriculture, and I was going to raise beef cows, Angus to be specific. Uh, you know, I had some great pasture. I had my eyes on some great pasture land and had my future all planned out. You know, had my cowboy boots and my horse and, and my hat, had all of my future planned out and then i went to this church on the uh the, on the wrong side of the track and walked in there and my whole entire world got turned upside down he i didn't choose him but he chose me and appointed me that i should go forth and bring forth fruit and let me tell you in this room this morning if you are born again by the blood of jesus christ you did not choose that he chose you and he chose you for a reason and that reason is that you would bear fruit you got to figure out what he wants you to do to start producing some fruit. That your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. When your life's right, you won't ask God for stupid stuff. I'm just saying. You know, you know somebody said, well, he said he would give me anything I wanted, so I'm going to start asking for rolls and cattle. No, that's, you know, when you get right, you won't ask stupid stuff. God does not do things randomly like God did not with Jeremiah. He told Jeremiah, before you were born, before you were ever conceived, I had a plan for you. I called you before you were in your mother's womb. And let me tell you, long before you accepted him, there was a call on your name. And the call on my name when it came due, there was a day in 1973 on September that it came due. September the 24th, it came due. And I went in that house of God and was arrested by the power of the living God. Was convicted of my sin to the point I could not stand up. Let me tell you, that is the God of heaven. He is, does not randomly do things. If you're in this room and your sins are forgiven and you're on your way to heaven, it was by His design. He chose you. He ordained you. He appointed you. And you can think what you want to. God doesn't do things randomly. Listen, God never makes a mistake. I've searched the Bible high and low looking for the mistake. And I can find nowhere where God said, oops. 
Sorry about that. You cannot find oops in the Bible. God could have created you in the 10th century. You know that? You could have been born in any, any year before the birth or after the birth. But for some reason, he wanted you to be born living today in the 21st century. Why? Because he has a plan and a purpose for you. You could have been born in Africa or China. Today you could be speaking Chinese or Swahili, but you're not. Why? Because God has a plan for your life. He chose to put you here in Washington State, in this church. God pre-selected your city, your state, and your church. And some of you have a hard time believing that. Well, let's just read Acts chapter 17, verse 26 in the Amplified. And he made from one common origin, one source, one blood, all nations of men to settle on the face of the earth, having definitely determined their allotted periods of time and the fixed boundaries of their habitation. Now, what do you do when you read stuff like that? What do you do with scriptures like that? And he made us from one origin. You know what that is, right? Dirt, just so you know. I mean, he didn't have to get real crazy. He just picked up a ball of dirt and rolled it up and slapped it and stepped on it and drew it and <laughs> blew on it, and there you were. I mean, that's kind of how he did you, out of the dust of the ground. Not even the good dirt, just the dust, that stuff that blows away that we, we, we don't like. He made you from one common origin, one source, one blood. All nations of men to settle on the face of the earth. Remember what he said in the beginning? He told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and to multiply and to do what? To cover the whole entire world. How was two people going to do that as big as this world is? That's a big monumental task. God had a plan. Because, you know, they, we'd all stayed there. We, we understand we'd all stay. They'd all stayed there. I mean, they got in the, in the plane of shooting area, and there they decided to stay, and they built the Tower of Babel, and God had to confuse their language. We have, a, we have a tendency to stick in one place. So let's just get that clear. But God decided that he made men, uh, all nations of men, to settle on the face of the earth, having definitely determined their allotted periods of time. In other words, you gotta, you got to... A beginning date and an expiration date. Just so you don't know what that means. That's what that means. And the fixed boundaries of their habitation. That means their settlements, their lands, and their abodes. God designed all of that for you. Isn't that awesome to know that? Listen, how else would a boy from Arkansas get in the state of Washington if God hadn't fixed this boundary for me? I'd have never left there. Man, I was knee-deep in southern, man. I wasn't about to leave. I was born and raised, talking southern language, eating fried chicken. I wasn't about to leave that place. But God got a hold of me and said, I'm moving you out of here. I mean, I was saved for six months and he moved me. Six months I was born again in my local church. I went to that church six months. They never even heard me preach but one sermon. My mother heard me preach three sermons in her entire life before she passed away because I was gone. She didn't get to hear me preach. She passed away when she was 54 years old. I got saved when I was 19, went in the Marine Corps shortly thereafter, and I had never been home since except for just a few days. How in the world would that have happened had God not set my boundaries? When I was born, he says, well, this guy's going to live in this place. He's going to be with that, and I'm going to do this, and this is where he's going to pastor. He don't have to like it. I'm going to change his southern eating. Man, I learned to eat rice and every other stuff. But, you know, I still like fried taters and pinto beans. God doesn't make any mistakes. He has a plan. Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Before he saved me, you know what he'd already decided about me? Like he decided about Jeremiah. You're going to be a prophet, Jeremiah. You're not even born yet. You've read in Jeremiah 1, right, where it says, Before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. So before I was ever conceived or thought of, he knew me. He knew what my name was going to be. He knew how tall I was going to be. I wish he would have made me a little taller, but had more fun in school playing basketball. But you know how it was. I mean, I would go up to shoot, and someone of them big, tall guys would just grab my ball in the air. 
Man, that's why I played football, because I definitely wasn't no good at basketball. Didn't have a chance. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Good works. Listen, if you're not doing a good work, you're outside the, what you're created for. And let me tell you what, when you are outside what you're created for, you're not a happy camper. Nothing in your life goes right. You are, of all men and women, most miserable. Which God prepared beforehand. I know, because you know what? He called me to preach, and I took off. I said, I'm having none of that preaching. No, I am not doing that. I don't want to get up in front of anybody. I want to be saved, but, you know, I want to be a one-on-one. I just want to tell people about Jesus. I passed out tracks. Man, I was a track-passing-out fool. The pulpit did not interest me. But that was not what God had ordained for me. I was backward. I was shy. I couldn't make oral book reports in high school. None of that stuff appealed to me. None of that getting up front. What appealed to me was riding a horse, tending to cows, and, you know, walking around with my cowboy hat on and, and my blue jeans. That's what appealed to me. That, none of this other stuff appealed to me at all. But beforehand, he had ordained that for me. And when I was born, he let me live 19 years before he reached out and touched me. But man, and when 19 years came, he reached out and grabbed me by the shirt collar. He said, you're going right over here, and I'm going to put you in a Pentecostal church. He could have put me anywhere in the world, but he put me in a Pentecostal church where I would know the fullness of the gospel because I'm a person that's got to know. Listen, if something stopped, show me in this book. I want you to show me. When they tell me healing stopped, I want you to show me in this Bible the clear scripture that said healing stopped. But then I'm going to show you some where it says it didn't stop. And, and, and the only one I really got to go to is Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I don't really need to go anywhere else, right? I mean, what he did yesterday, he's doing today. And guess what? He's going to be doing it tomorrow also. So we just need to settle all of those types of things. And, and I couldn't have been in any place because they'd have been upset with me because I'd have been asking, how come we don't do this? God prepared our past beforehand that we should walk in them. He has a plan for each and every one of us. And it is our responsibility to find out what His plan for you is. God chose you for a specific reason. If He did not have a special purpose for you, and if He didn't want you to succeed, then He wouldn't, you would not have been born. God's reasons for saving us. Let me give you some of those. What was God's reason for saving us? Was it just so you could get to heaven? Was that the only reason he sent his son? Absolutely not. If getting you to heaven was the only reason for saving you, then when you prayed through in an altar, he would have killed you. If that was the only reason, why let you go through all the sin and, and the fighting and have to spend hours praying and calling on the name of God? If his only purpose was just to get you to heaven, then when you got saved, doom, that would be it, out of here. I, that's not a bad way to go, but that's not what he done it for. His job would have been complete. He would have just killed you and sent you on. He might as well just get you onward and upward. But that's not what he did. There wouldn't have been any use for you hanging around if that's all he came for was to save you. But that's not the only reason. He saved you and he placed a message in your heart, a message of good news about the eternal life through Jesus Christ. Look at Romans 10, 13. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We don't preach that enough anymore. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Satan knows that and he fills our lives with stuff. Producing Christians without joy because of all the stuff that's more important to us than Jesus Christ. What was his plan? His plan is our responsibility. I read a story in preparing for this sermon about a Christian nurse who was in charge of a very sick man in the hospital. And the doctors had told this nurse, uh, she was a Christian, that this guy is not going to live. He's going to die. And uh, one day she came to work, and the, and, and the doctors told her he's not going to live through the day because he's had a very bad night, and he's not going to make it. So she spent all day long and all night long praying for this man to be saved. It's a true story. And as she prayed for him, she came to work the next morning, and she walked in, and this guy is sitting up in bed, eating breakfast, totally and absolutely healed. 
He's sitting up there, and so she came in. She said, praise the Lord, you're healed. He said, I feel great. Your prayers have healed me. She said, no, it was not me. God did, and now it's your responsibility to find out why. It's your responsibility to find out why God healed you and raised you off of your deathbed. It's your responsibility. Can I tell you, it's your responsibility to find out what God wants you to do. And listen. He doesn't want you to come to church for 40 years and sit on a pew and warm it. He's got something for you to do. And you need to find out about what God wants you to do. You need to get plugged into the church you go to. You need to get knee deep. You need to get up to your neck involvement and start beginning to do things. You say, I don't have the time. Then you're way too busy. Cut something else out. Something else that won't really matter at the end. God did not save us so we, could ex- so we could have access to someone who would answer all of our prayers. Did you know that God's not a genie in the bottle that you get to rub and he just does whatever. He's just at your beck and call all the time. That's not what he saved you for. We are his servants. We belong to him. We exist for his purpose and not any other thing. He saved us and gave us a second chance. Now we need to find out why. I was taught when I got saved, I, needed, I was taught by my old preacher, you need to find out why God saved you, boy. Back south, they call you boy. I don't care. They just do. Someone told you, you're a boy. It's not a derogatory thong. I was called boy all my life growing up. Boy, get over here. Boy, what are you doing? Boy, stop doing that. And it didn't matter if it was your daddy or who it was. If you was, if you was young, you was a boy. And my pastor, he was 70 years old. He said, boy, you need to find out why you got saved. I said, well, how do you propose I do that? He said, well, I'll help you. Bad idea to go pray with your preacher. He said, I'm getting old. I'm looking for the next guy. Had no idea what that meant at that time. Found out what that meant. He just took all of his own. He said, I'm going to put it on you. He began to pray for me. And three weeks after I was saved, I was called to preach the gospel. Three weeks. I was saved three weeks. I was saved one week exactly when I taught my first Sunday school class by accident. If you, if you understand, I, I taught my first Sunday school class by accident. I walked in, in church the next Sunday, walked into the Sunday school class. That's back when we started at 10 o'clock and had, had Sunday school from 10 to 11 and worship from 11 to whatever time you got out. I walked into Sunday school class and the teacher wasn't there and none of the other students that had been coming to church a long time felt it was their call to pre- teach the class. So they handed me the book and said, you're teaching today, hope you... Are prepared? I said, well, uh, uh, really, I didn't even have a book, but uh, how do you do this? I said, well, you just go up there, and you open it up, and you read the lesson, and you, you talk about it. I said, well, sounds easy enough. So I took the book and went up front and opened it up and read it and talked about it. That was my first sermon. Mark chapter 8, verse 36. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Let me tell you, if, you, if, you're step, if, you're, if God's called you to do something and you're not doing that, that there scripture's going come to come to face you. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world? Listen, if, if you're busy making a living and doing all those things, look, we have to make a living. I mean, you know, Adam kind of did that for us. I mean, if they hadn't ate that fruit, we might not be doing this hard manual labor. I don't know. But we have to work and make a living for our families. But if you spend all of your time making a living for your family and none of your time making time for the Almighty God, it won't profit you anything at all. The application for sinners is obvious. What is not obvious is the application for the Christian. It could be applied this way, and let's think about it for just a moment this way. And I'm getting ready to close. What would it profit a Christian if all his prayers were answered? He had a fine house and abundant income and blessings galore. But he missed the very reason for which he was created. What a waste that would be. And I want to leave you with that question today. What would it profit you as a Christian today if God answered every prayer that you prayed, give you a great house to live in, abundant income, blessings just more than you could even do, but you missed the very reason for which you were created? When I got out of the Marine Corps and went back home, 
I was at home 10 days before I left coming back to, to and went to, to my minister in training. Went and was assigned to a senior pastor for two and a half years. I stayed home 10 days. In fact, I, when I got to the airport off the airplane out of the Marine Corps, when I got to the airport, I bought me a one-way ticket back to where I was supposed to go because I knew that the devil's going to try to keep me here because, boy, I tell you, the attraction was, was strong to stay home. Boy, that southern accent came back. And them, I smelled them pinto beans and cornbread cooking and fried taters and, and the cows are mooing and the horses are, you know, neighing. And I'm thinking, oh, God, I'm in heaven almost here. I knew it would be, I knew it would be attractive. So when I got off the airplane to the airport, I went and bought my ticket to go back to, to where I was going to take my MIT at. I didn't even say hi to my dad. I bought my ticket first. I wasn't home three days, and the place where I had worked came to me and said, we want to give you this business. We want to sell this business to you. It's a grocery business, very successful, very, uh, very thriving business. We, we, it came with a house. It came with a gas station. It came with a, with a fish market. It came with all kinds of things. It came with a store, you know, to sell groceries and all that. It came with all of those things. Said, we, want it. we want you to buy this because I worked for them when I was in high school. We want, to, we want to sell this to you, and we'll sell it to you for a reasonable price. We're ready to retire. All you got to do is sign here, and you can just make payments to us. We, we don't need the money. Just, just make payments to us, and we'll sell it to you for dirt cheap. And I took the books, and I sat down and looked at them, and I thought, my Lord, there's a lot of money to be made here because I knew about business. There's a lot of money to be made here. And I closed that book. And I handed it back to them, and I said, you know, I do appreciate that, but no. God has called me to preach, and I've got to go find what God wants me to do. I've got to find my destiny, and I have no clue what God wants me to do. But I know that, that this is not it. I could have had the boast of, best of both worlds. I could have had a lucrative business, and I, could have I would have had two businesses. I could have raised cattle, and I could have had a grocery store, and could have bought feed and all the stuff I needed at a discount because I was in business and was a business owner. But I knew that was not God's destiny for me. I knew what God had called me to do. I just didn't know how I was going to do it. And you know, God has a way of getting your attention. I went to, I went, when I went in the Marine Corps, I was stationed, one of the stations I was on was Hawaii. And uh, as I was there, I found a church, I found a church, a church over, a church of God over there. I passed it, and I found it, but boy, and I was excited because I wanted to go to church. And the pastor over there was a barber, and he used to cut all the Marines because I, I brought about 25 Marines to, I bought me a, well, I didn't buy it. I borrowed a, an old Volkswagen bug, a bus, you know. The, you remember the old Volkswagen bus with the, the shift that when you shifted it grinded? <laughs> I had one of those, and I'd fill it up with Marines every Sunday. I'd make a couple of trips to the base and pick all the Marines up I could possibly find. And so... You know, I never said anything to him about being a preacher or being called to preach or nothing. I kept that down on the down low. One day he's back there and he's cutting all of our hair and I came and sat down. You know, Marine Corps haircut's easy. Zip, zip, and there's nothing left. <laughs> so he was cutting our hair, you know, and, and as he was cutting my hair, he stopped and he put his hand on my head. Why, I don't know. He said, you know, you ought to preach for me Sunday night. I could have fell off in that floor. And I sat there for a few minutes, and, and I said yes. To my surprise, I don't know why I said yes, but I said yes. And then I asked him, how did you know? He said, boy, when you call to preach, it shows. I don't know what he saw. I don't know what God revealed to him in that place. But I know he didn't find out from me. And he mentored me and loved me and helped me. What an amazing God we have. What an amazing God we serve today. Do you in this room know your destiny? Do you know what God has called you to do? Listen, not everybody's going to be a preacher. Or a teacher or a musician or a singer. You're not going to be that. But it takes a whole lot of things to make a church a church. It takes people to drive the bus, to be in hospitality, 
to take care of the building. I'm so thankful we got guys that do that. This is a big building. And I never have to worry about any of the maintenance. It's just always done. That is just so incredible for me. Thank you, Randy and team. They just take care of this building. They paint when it needs to be painted. When you walk down these hallways, you don't see black marks all over the wall. It's because they're, they're running in here painting all the time, keeping everything going like it's supposed to be. You might be one of those that cooks dinner and serves dinners and cleans the building and does all of those things. But it takes all of that. You might be the one that goes to the youth camp. Thank you, LaDonna, and all of them that go and cook. That's, that's monumental. I mean, you go up there and you, it's, you cook for all these kids and you sleep on a bed that's not meant for human people to sleep on. If you've never been up there and slept on one, go try. You, you'll come back saying, oh, no, it's not. But that's the sacrifice. I think of Rainier who every Monday and every Thursday and every Sunday, he's at daybreak taking care of these boys. They've been doing it for 11 years. Never a complaint because that's what God's called him to do is to affect young men and women with the gospel. I remember Rainier, when he turned 35, he said, well, you know, I'm not youth anymore. I said, Rainier, as long as 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 you're living, as long as you're living. He said, I just got one word, two words for you, Josh McDowell. You're going to be working with young people as long as you live because that's God's gift. That's what God has gifted Rainier to do, and he is excellent at it. You need to find what God wants you to do, and then you need to do it. If, you're a, if you can teach, if God has called you to teach, and you have the ability to teach, and you don't teach, if you have the ability to lead singing and worship, and you don't do that, you'll never, ever be happy. Ever. You need to find your place in His house, and you need to start serving in His house. And you will find the joy that passes understanding. If you're here today and you do not know Christ as your personal Savior, that is the greatest need that you have. If you have not said, Lord Jesus, forgive my sins, I repent, come into my heart. If you have not done that, if you have not done that, that is your need. That is your great need today. Is there anyone in this room who would like to accept Christ? Just raise your hand. If you want to invite him into your heart to change your life, is anybody in this room? Let me tell you, he will alter your life and help you. Would all of you stand with me today? We want to take a minute to pray. And as you're praying, I want you to ask God, God, how have you placed me in this body? You might be an usher. You might work in the AV back there, running sound and putting the scriptures on the board and making the videos I just give all that stuff to them that video that was shown I just gave John the address said John I need this Uh, can you have this Sunday and well it was here and it was right and tight I don't have to worry about any of those things because that's his gift John looks at a computer and his mouth runs he talks that gibberish to me sometimes I said John in English just put it in English and sometimes I say just do it because I don't understand a thing you're saying because I don't I know how to turn my computer on and get it to go off when I'm done with it you need to find what you do find what God wants you to do and then do it with all of your gusto do it with everything that's in you let's pray this morning Father I am grateful to you because you're a living trusting caring God Lord, you entrusted the entire gospel of the world to 12 men. Lord, you empowered those men, and that that gospel has spread around the world into every nation on the planet. It's changing men and women in communist nations around the world, changing men and women in Islamic nations around the world, touching their lives and breaking them out of prison. I can't even begin to understand all that you do and how you do it, but I know that you do. I know that nothing's impossible with you. I know that nothing's impossible with me if I believe. And Lord, I believe you today. In the presence of belief, miracles happen, and I believe you. 
And I ask you for this congregation today that you would touch every heart, that you would speak to every life. Lord, that you would help them to find their place in your body and begin to labor there. Lord, whatever you've gifted them to do, whatever you've called them to do, whatever you're working on their hearts to get involved in, whatever ministry, Lord, I pray that they would just get involved in it and let the joy of the Lord begin to rise up in them. Lord, we've been praying for a while. You know, Rainier is going to the daybreak. We've been praying for someone who could work with the ladies and the young ladies. And God, we just ask you to fulfill that. Lord, we need more people to come alongside in children's church and work. And we're asking you to do that, Lord. We need more people on the maintenance team and the hospitality team and, and the ministry team and the teaching and all that goes on in this local body. We need your help, Father. We need someone in men's ministry. God, we need a director there in that place. We're asking you that you begin to touch people and they would begin to step up, Lord. You'd begin to call them. They'd fulfill their destiny, Lord. God, we pray and ask it all in Jesus' name today. And for his sake we pray. Amen, amen.